So welcome to all of you. Um, again, my name is Namira, and today we are going to be joined by three panelists uh, talking about some very important topics. So we have uh, Hala, Fatima, and Kohler who will be talking about disability, stigma, um, their journeys, and the work that they do uh, in Michigan and throughout the nation. So each of them will be introducing themselves a little bit for us and then spending about five to 10 minutes talking about their journeys, their experiences, their wisdom, sharing with us. And then we'll be having a moderated panel discussion, um, taking your audience questions and then wrapping up for the evening. So thank you again for joining us. What we will do now is actually get started with our first panelist. Um, so our first panelist is Fatima, who works with Mahsen. And Fatima, I will hand it over to you so you can introduce yourself and talk to us a little bit for about five to 10 minutes. Thank you, Namira. Assalamu alaikum and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Fatima al Kasir Uthman. I am a chapter lead for Michigan for the Muslims Understanding and Helping Special Education Needs. My background is in special education. I've been a special education teacher for about eight years, and I'm also recently have become a board certified behavior analyst. Um, and I've also worked as a behavior technician with kids with autism for about two years. Mainly my work has been with uh, children with autism, but I've worked with um, children from ages two all the way through 19 that have a wide range of disabilities. Um, so that's a little bit about me. As for my personal experience, um, like for Muslim families that I've met and I've worked with who have a child with uh, autism or another disability, um, oftentimes I'm asked if I know Muslim service providers such as BCBAs or behavior technicians or respite care workers who can work directly with their children um, who are Muslim. Now, the fact is, is that I myself, um, I'm a Muslim service provider and um, my training and education in these fields has been more or less the same as my non-Muslim counterparts. So even if I were to provide services to Muslims, um, I more or less have to adhere to a standard of care that is the same across the board, no matter who my clients are. And the same with my non-Muslim client or my non-Muslim colleagues, they have to um, adhere to a certain level of care and standards with their own clients as well. So I started to ask myself, given the fact that, you know, my education and background is not that different than my colleagues, I started to ask myself the question, why? Why is it important for Muslims that they receive care from Muslim professionals when non-Muslim professionals receive the same level of professional training? And mainly the answers that I got for this were that they wanted someone who was similar to them in their beliefs, their culture, because they will understand more. And this kind of got me thinking that as professionals who work with people with disabilities, we're missing something. So it's either that non-Muslim service providers um, might have a deficiency, let's say, in their skill set to be able to work with Muslim fam families in a culturally sensitive manner, or simply the fact that there aren't enough Muslims in these fields um, and not enough Muslims choosing careers that provide to provide care to people with disabilities. And as it turns out, it's a little bit of both. So while differences in care have been examined for other racial minorities, such as the African-American community and the Latinx um, community and you know, for people with disabilities, there's not a whole lot known about the same experiences specific to Muslim, Muslim Americans with disabilities. And um, facilities, facilities that are dedicated to care and treatment of people with disabilities often lack staff who have the necessary um, communication skills or language skills or who are knowledgeable in the cultural attitudes and beliefs of Muslim clients. And certain attitudes that we value while delivering services um, in the American um, in the American care system, let's say, um, we value qualities such as independence, self determination, or person centered planning. Those might be very unfamiliar to some of the Muslim families we serve, and those may further isolate them and um, hinder treatment. And so there needs to be more of a focus on training professionals in cultural humility in order to be able to work with Muslims. 
Now, as for the Muslim professionals who work in service del delivery for people with disabilities, there's just not enough of them. Overwhelmingly, fields such as speech therapy, applied behavior analysis, teaching, occupational therapy are dominated by white females. And the need for people with more diverse backgrounds cannot be understated. And this includes Muslims. So it's important to bring a new perspective into these fields to maximize outcomes for people with disabilities. And it's important for clients to feel comfortable with their care. Thanks so much, Fatima. It's such a um, great start to thinking about the care that people need to, re uh, need to receive. And also just that intersection, right, of disability, race, religion, um, all of the different aspects that go into lived reality and lived experiences of people who are um, either living with disabilities or caring for people with disabilities, just the entire kind of community. So thank you so much for that. Um, I'm gonna actually take it to our next panelist and then come back for some larger questions. So next up is Hala, who will be talking, uh, introducing herself and then talking a little bit about stigma and her experience and her journey. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, you can. Uh, salam everyone. Um, uh, hello, welcome. Um, my name is Hala Alazawi. Um, I am a uh, Arab American slash Muslim and Muslim uh, disability advocate advocate in uh, the Dearborn and uh, Metro Detroit area. Um, and I hold a bachelor's degree in sociology and women's studies, uh, as well as a minor in Arab American studies. Um, I, I am also, I also served as the community outreach coordinator at the Detroit Health Department uh, in order to alleviate um, the effects and impacts of overdose uh, on the Detroit community with regards to the opioid uh, pandemic. Uh, currently, I am attempting to pursue a master's degree in social work and hope to focus on disability uh, through this um, uh, educational journey. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about stigma in the Arab American community and, and some of the things that I've undergone that I found to be stigmatizing. A um, little bit of a disclaimer, I in no way mean any offense to anyone. Um, I understand that while some of these incidences may occur with pure intentions, um, the, the way that people interact with disability and the vocabulary that they use and the language that we, we are commonly, um, we commonly associate with disability needed, needs to be improved. So I just want to make it clear that I in no way mean any offense to anyone, but these, you know, particular experiences made me feel otherized and stigmatized, um, for sure. Um, I feel that special treatment of people with disabilities uh, may materialize into a form of stigma, even if unintentional. Uh, by treating people with disabilities as different, uh, this reinforces the negative perception that people with disabilities are not capable of leading functional agenic lives. And so um, what I've encountered is that oftentimes individuals with a disability in this community may feel like they are other or excluded from certain spaces on both social and structural levels. Um, and then reducing, and then this causes able, our able-bodied counterparts to often reduce individuals to their disabilities instead of looking at their character. So, you know, like I have a hyper-visible disability. So, I mean, my disability is very obvious. I, I use a walker as an assistive device. And so, and so while many of these issues pose barriers uh, with people living with a disability, particularly those with a visible disability, there are many actions that families and loved ones can take in order to reduce these obstacles and gradually eliminate stigma. Um, so on a social level, again, I talked a little bit about how, you know, the first thing that people see is my walker. So they automatically, like right then and there, I am boxed into a category that says vulnerable and needing constant round-the-clock care. And my goal from, from this event and from my activism 
is to deconstruct that narrative along with my fellow panelists, which I believe that like my fellow panelists Fatma raised some wonderful points. Um, and so I guess like I'm gonna share some of the incidents that I found stigmatizing that I've undergone. Um, just to give people an idea of what people with a disability on a day to day may go through. Um, so, for example, I've encountered people saying that they feel bad for me. So, um, I'll, I'll give one particular example. I was, uh, my friends had taken me out for my birthday uh, last December. And as I was walking out of the restaurant, you know, my friends, they got me a cake, they sang happy birthday. But then as I was walking out, outside, out the restaurant, like outside of the restaurant, sorry, outside of the restaurant, um, these ladies saw me and they were, they were obviously, they seemed Middle Eastern because, you know, they, um, in Arabic, they, you know, they wished me a happy birthday and everything. They were like, happy birthday, happy birthday. I'm like, thank you, happy, thank you. And then, um, so then, as I was walking out, as I was still in earshot, they said, Haram, I feel so bad for her. So <laughs> my first instinct from this, and for those of you who are non-Arabic speakers, Haram can either mean, in, depending on the context you're using, it can either mean forbidden or it can either mean poor thing. So, or pitiable thing, basically, or something deserving of pity or someone deserving of pity. So, so I understood it in this context to mean obviously someone deserving of pity because I mean, I'm half Lebanese, I've, I've heard it so many times. And my first thought was to turn around and tell these women, I don't think you have anything to be sorry for, for me. I have, you know, a, a bachelor's degree from a, you know, pretty repu reputable institution with two majors and a minor, and I graduated with, with high distinction. And I'm, I'm like serving as the community outreach coordinator at this really great department, <laughs> but I didn't. I didn't turn around for fear of uh, starting a fight, you know, cause I was always taught, you know, like by my parents, I, I love them, but my dad always taught me, you know, like they're just trying to help. You know, they're not, they don't mean anything malicious. Don't walk away from confrontation. But, you know, I, I did feel sort of bad that I didn't turn around and I didn't, you know, stand up for myself and that I didn't make it out that I'm more capable than they think I am. I'm much more capable than they think I am. And although I, I you know, I knew that they didn't mean it in a malicious way. They didn't intentionally mean it to come off as malicious it sure came off that way because they were otherizing me they already placed me in this category because of my walker and and they didn't even like care to get to know like who i was as a person uh, granted i don't i don't need them to even to try to get to know me if they don't feel inclined to do so they were just people in passing but at the very least give me the same dignity that you would give an able-bodied person Give me the same dignity because honestly, it's so frustrating, like being at the gym, like a couple months ago, I was called an inspiration for, for just like being on like machines, like everybody else. I am like, and I'm sorry if I'm coming off as pushy, but I am tired of this narrative because I am not trying to inspire you by doing an everyday thing. If it was like, I guarantee you, if it was like, you know, an, an Arab man who's able-bodied, they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't be like, oh, you're, you know, you're an inspirational person. But because I believe that because I'm a woman, and, which makes me already vulnerable in the context of the Muslim community because I'm a woman and because I have a hyper visible disability, I'm constantly, constantly being bombarded with this inspiration sort of narrative when really I'm not trying to inspire you. I'm trying to do an everyday thing that, that I have a right to do. I have a right to be in this public space and I will not apologize. It took me a while 
not to apologize for the space I'm in. People would run into me and I would be the one to apologize. I would be the one to say I was sorry because I thought that the problem lied with me. For so long, I internalized the fact that because I'm this way, that I, I have to apologize, that I should be the one, you know, telling them, you know, I'm, I'm sorry for being this way, but it's not me. It's the society that wasn't built around people like me, you know? So it's like, so it's very, very like frustrating and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little like emotional here, but it's just, it's, it's very frustrating not to be treated with the same dignity that I treat all individuals, you know? And, and it's just like, I, I know that I'm one of the people, because I wanna be a social worker and an advocate for all vulnerable populations, you know, I look at people's situations first and I don't judge, you know, it's like, don't look at me and just assume things about me and just like, you know, follow me around like you want to help me like you want to do a charitable thing for me. If I didn't ask you for help, you have, I'm sorry, you have no right to help me. I'm an agentic individual and I reserve the right to ask for help when I when I need help. You know, and I and I'm sorry. I know you're trying to do a good thing, but please, please, for everyone listening today, please end this narrative around vulnerability and 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 disability. Please end this narrative because you're taking away from our agency by doing this. You're taking away from our right as agentic individuals. And I know that you know you may have the best of intentions, and I respect that but please take the time to come up to us and ask because that gives us the dignity we need. And, um, and also like, you know, I've like, I, this shaped my perception since I was young too. I'm just gonna like add one final story and then I'll get to the you know, way that we can improve. So even when I was young, like my parents, they never made me feel like I was any different. My father, god bless him and like you know keep him in his health and everything he he always encouraged me to go out there and do the best that i could you know even when things got hard he you know he always thought that i'm gonna be you know someone who inspires other people and i'm again i'm not saying i'm not being like um i'm not trying to like gloat or anything like that i'm <laughs> But I just like, he always thought that, you know, I'm going to go out there and do something because I have the will. I have the will to go out there and do something and I have the resources to go out there and do something. So, you know, he, he always thought of me as not any different than anybody else. But even when I was a little kid, I would be excluded from like, you know, doing like physical activities like playing tag or things like that. Like I would always be told, oh, you're being too slow or you're, you know, you're holding us up. Well, you know, I, I'd appreciate it. I'd appreciate it if parents would sit down with their children and actually like let them know that, okay, this person, while they use an assistive device, they're not any, you know, they're not any different than you. They're not any different than you. They may use a different way to get around, but that doesn't make them like slow or, or, you know, excuse me for this word, like it doesn't make them like a burden, you know? And I just, and I really, really like, ever since I've experienced all these things, I've, I've come to the conclusion that if parents don't change the rhetoric around disability, and if families, if it doesn't start from home, it's not gonna change. It's not gonna change, unfortunately. But I do have some recommendations um, for uh, parents and you know their children and their loved ones if, if they wanna know how to dismantle this negative narrative around disability. Um, so, you know, just, you know, join, um, a joint organization such as, you know, the wonderful MDRC, the Michigan Disability Rights Coalition. 
um, and, and learn, learn about like, you know, intersectionality and, you know, sensitivity training and, and like, feel free to, you know, go to like a inclusive health committee meeting, you know, for the, you know, healthy Dearborn coalition, like you can learn so much about how to make Dearborn more accessible, not only that, and how to make just like structurally how to make places and spaces more accessible for people with disabilities and, and just how to change the narrative around disability. And um, you can uh, also um, go to places that have culturally linguistic appropriate resources. I know that, you know, a lot of us, I'm first generation American. So, you know, my parents are immigrants. So, you know, a lot of immigrant families, including, you know, my mother, Alayat uh, Hamha, she, she passed on three years ago, but including my mother, like she didn't, you know, for, for, you know, she lived here for 20 years and for 20 years, she didn't, you know, she wasn't fluent in English and I had to be her translator. So please, please feel free to reach out to organizations that have culturally linguistic services when, you know, interacting with families and parents with disabilities so that, you know, families and their children don't feel otherized, don't feel alienated when they're coming to you. And finally, just, you know, feel free to go to more widespread informative events and seminars and media resources designed to change the perception of disability in, in, in Muslim communities. If, if you're available and if you have the time. I know that life can be very like bustle, hustle and bustle, especially with the pandemic. But please, please, if you have the time, please attend events like this in order to just widen the spread of information and disseminate more positive narrative around disability. Thank you. Ooh, that was fire. <laughs> and in the comments, like so much, thank you so much for that energy, for the truth and for the wisdom that you just dropped because that was real and so needed. Um, yeah, I wanted to uplift some of the things that you mentioned. I mean, the ties with what Fatima was talking about around the culturally responsive resources, that's huge. I think so many people have had that experience of being that support for their parents, right? Um, especially if language kind of translation services are needed. And I really wanted to like emphasize just the narrative piece of things because this is so true, the secrecy, the shame, the stigma. Um, earlier today, I was in a workshop talking about identity. And one of the things that came up was around the fact that these systems that are out there like ableism, they target certain identities, but it's not because those identities are inherently bad. And that's where so much of this comes from, the shaming of this um, kind of um, ableism, really, you know, at the end of the day. So yeah, I really wanted to uplift that. Um, one of the comments uh, in the chat, somebody noted that, you know, we found people were scared as if they would catch a disability for my child. And we're in this world where people place that uh, blame on somebody because of their own disability instead of really looking to the barriers that are in the world. So thank you so much. I'm going to turn it over now to our final panelist um, for Khodr to introduce himself and then to talk to us for a little bit. And then we are going to be opening the floor up for questions. So if people already have questions, please use the Q&A or the chat feature. And I'm gonna hand it over to Khodr now. Thanks so much. Sure, uh, thank you, Munira. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, can we can. You? Okay, you can? Yes, we can. Yep, we can hear you. I want to make sure. Um, I first and for, foremost, I would like to thank the Michigan Disability Rights Coalition for putting this together. This is very important, very instrumental topic to talk about, especially within the Muslim community as well as the Middle Eastern um, community as well. Uh, we really we've come a long way. Yet we have a lot of you know. Uh, I mean, we have much more to work on. Um, also, I would like to thank Omer. Um, I would like to thank Hala and Fatima for such powerful words. Um, Hala spot on, um, you know, because I, I always say this, nobody can tell our stories better than we can say it and, and, and narrate it and talk about our challenges and not only that, but also how we can overcome the challenges. So having said that, um, my name is Khadr Farhat, and I was born blind in Beirut, Lebanon back on June 8th of 1993. 
I attended a private school for the blind, deaf, autistic, learning, disabled, speech, and, and you know, disabled, and what have you. So we were not included in a public school system like what we do here in the states. So therefore, the, the community and the society overseas did not have a lot of things um, to understand and know about us. And this is a huge problem: is that not only that we are not included in the um, overall in the large society, but also uh, parents, I mean, consider this topic as taboo, um, you know, even parents of those that, you know, uh, go through a challenge. I love to call it challenge, by the way. I don't like to call it disability. And when I get to Congress 10, 15 years from now, I promise, and quote me on this, if I ever make it there, I'm going to do my best to change this term ever in the law to make it challenge because I believe that nobody is perfect. We have visible disabilities like mine, like Hala's, and also we have the invisible one. But unfortunately, as Hala said, people often pick on the visible one because they can see it. And often people are very visual and they go by what they see. They don't really dig into the book. They go and they judge about anything else from the cover that they see. And that's why oftentimes we see a lot of problems because we look at something, it looks nice, but then digging deep in, inside of it, it really rotten, to be honest with you. And uh, um, so I, having said that, I had a huge responsibility overseas to educate us around me. Um, I mean, they were surprised that I go to school. I was so thankful for that school because if it wasn't for that school, you know, given all the stigma that I was talking about a minute ago, yet if it wasn't for that school, I would not become educated myself. And um, I stayed there until 2009 when my dad decided to immigrate to the States looking for better opportunities. Uh, when it comes to education, medical treatment, and uh, prosperous future. You know, having said that too, I uh, immigrated here. I didn't speak a word of English back then. Didn't know a lot of people except for a few family members and being blind. That even made it way more difficult. Made it more difficult, yet not impossible. I'm not going to idealize here uh, disability. I'm not going to make blindness look, um, sound, um, you know, uh, easy. Not at all. I'm a very realistic person. However, I have to start from one point. If it wasn't for the strong faith in Allah, God, subhanahu wa ta'ala, I cannot be where I'm at today. So since we are targeting the Muslim audience today, specifically, and this is for everybody also, even if they're not Muslim, the spiritual power that I do possess and that I do hold dear and in my heart to Allah, God, you know, is like no other. If it wasn't, for my love and faith, for my strong and unshakable faith in him, I cannot be patient. If you close your eyes for a minute, Imam Ali said, if you want to know God's best blessing that is bestowed upon you, just close your eyes for a minute. Eyesight is one of the most important senses. And I'm not trying to catch anybody here by emotions. But once you wake up, you open your eyes. Once you want to learn something, they instantly say, look. Because by you looking at something innocently, your brain is getting a copy of it. And that's going to, you know, go trickle down to all the other senses from, you know, committing the action and completing the task. So I would like to emphasize on the spiritual side, beside the accommodations and beside the understanding and beside paving the way for equality, accessibility and equity. If it's not, if it wasn't for that strong faith, and Allah, God subhanahu wa ta'ala, I cannot be where I'm at today. And I'm not going to be anywhere else. And that's why God is always on my heart and on my mind and in our heart. Coming up to the States, I went to Lincoln Park High School because Dearborn does not have a program for the blind. That's why I'm running for school board. That's part of it is I want to make that adequate representation on the school board. And hopefully winning on November 3rd will make me the very first blind school board trustee ever in Dearborn history. It's not about the accolade. It's not about the spotlight, but it's about making sure that everyone, regardless of their voice, ethnicity, language, color, socioeconomic status, and story, that they have a voice at the table. It is the time to actually sit on the table and no longer being placed on the menu. We should tell our stories and we should voice our own concerns. We know our problems and we do know, and we do know the solutions. So coming here to the high school, it was very tough. I had to learn the language. And then I went to Henry Ford College where I pursued my associate degree in special ed. And then I went to the University of Michigan and I pursued my undergrad in political science. Why I pursued political science? Because I wanted to make a change in the actual game. How the 
game is being played. It's great to be on the sideline, cheering on, advocating, and leading so many activism-related activities. However, if you're not in the game itself, you cannot make much of a difference. So starting from 2012, I started to volunteer with so many hospitals, libraries, uh, colleges, campuses, uh, organizations, trying to tell people that it's not surprising for a blind person in specific and a disabled person in general to pursue a higher education degree, to actually land on a great job opportunity, to get married, open up a house and become so successful. As a matter of fact, I know a lot of justices, a lot of judges, um, a lot of lawyers, um, a lot of engineers, a lot of mechanics, believe it or not, a lot of civil engineers, um, a lot of educators, admins, professors, uh, you know, degree holders, uh, people that possess great jobs with Apple, Microsoft, you know, and they are blind or disabled. So it's not that surprising. Yes, it is challenging. Yes, it does require a lot of work, way more efforts, and even sometimes, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of other resources like I can tell you one thing, and then I'm going to jump into advocacy and what we can do to improve everything. An average student needs to buy a $200, $300 worth of a computer. Okay, I can do that. However, I cannot access my computer without a talking program. Before MacBooks are here, I used to purchase a $995 worth of a talking program, plus the two, $300 laptop, that's going to make it up to $1,200. Transportation, I can't drive. I can't ride my bike to school. I can't walk to school because of the highways and everything. And actually, you cannot walk at all, even if you can see. What does that mean? It means that if you are not going to land on a great and reliable transportation, and if you're not going to have the resources, if you're not going to be creative, you cannot land on all of these accommodations, which means if you don't, you're not going to pursue education. And therefore, you're not going to land on a job. And therefore, you're not going to build yourself a great life and the future ahead. So as you guys can tell, it's a connected circle. I went to school. I was so thankful that I received what I had received overseas. I came over here, I overcame language barrier, blindness and everything. And here I am today, I'm proud to say that I'm an advocate, a public policymaker and a candidate for Dearborn School Board. Why I do, to, why I do what I do is to see more justice. And not only for the disabled population, regardless of their disability, for everybody, for the voiceless, for the underprivileged, for those who do not have the money to pay their bills or obtain any utility or any accommodation. I know what hardship is, and so I'm pretty sure that everybody here also you know, does know that because it is very difficult. Now, for Muslims, I would like to point out one more important thing from a religious standpoint and from a social standpoint. Religiously, we're talking, I was born blind. And myself and my siblings, which not a whole lot of people know about that, are blind. And we are the only three blind people in the entire family, from my mom's side from my, and my dad's side. We did not decide to born like that. So if someone want to come against this issue, they are coming simply against God's will. And those who claim to be believers and strong and have a strong faith in God, trust me, your prayers and fasting and everything in between is not going to be counted if you're going to go against God's will. And I've seen it firsthand in a personal level and with a lot of stories. When disabled women are being rejected, you know, when it comes to marriage because they are blind or deaf or in a wheelchair. When same thing, disabled men are being rejected when it comes to marriage, you know, when it comes to this. This is, this is very common and popular thing. The second point is, as Hala touched on, we know when people make you feel like, you know, you are an example of being weak. You know what? I walk, I walk it better than I can talk it. And I'm not saying this out of cockiness. I'm not saying it because I'm over overconfidence. I keep my actions louder than my words. And I can tell you that we've come a long way. Yet we have a lot of, a lot of stuff to work on. I would like to conclude this remark and then I'll be more than happy. And I encourage people to ask questions and ask the tough questions. Number one, we need to educate our children when they interact with disabled children, that again, I love to call them challenged, to understand that nobody is perfect. Yeah, I don't, I, I, I can't see, but doesn't mean you're better than me in the math class. Doesn't mean that you're better than me when it comes to politics or law or philosophy 
or X or Y or Z. Everyone is gifted some way, somehow. We are unique. And this diversity, what makes us really as humans so awesome. And when it comes to society, I'm blessed to say that I have immigrated to the States because it gave me the opportunity. No place is called perfect. However, at least we have the equal opportunity to apply for a job, go to school and pursue higher education. However, as disabled people ourselves, it is our responsibility to educate those around us and even outside our network. So many people, they don't mean it to be like, they don't mean to be rude or mean, but yet we can kindly and respectfully guide them to how to uh, deal with us, talk with us in such manner. I go to the gym, for example, before the pandemic, right? I used to go to the gym almost every single day, 4.30 in the morning, six o'clock in the morning, 7 p.m., 10 a.m., what have you. And people sometimes, you know, they call me inspiration. And I would like to emphasize on that point. So when I can tell from the first word, you know, like, and their voice tone, like, like what do they mean by it? Now, it can be an inspiration in a good way because a lot of people that can drive and they can see and then they can get themselves to the gym, yet they're not doing it. While I am, my, I'm talking about myself, I can't drive and yet I'm in the gym taking care of my health, which is the best God's blessing that is well bestowed upon me. But when people overly comment on that, yes, as Hala said again, sorry for picking on you Hala today, as Hala said, you know, it becomes so annoying. Like you think that you're encouraging me, you think that you are uh, being doing us some good and some justice, but whereas you are making us feel abnormal. And that the big border that people should not cross. Yes, it takes village. Yes, it takes courage. Yes, it takes motivation. And yes, it does take perseverance. However, at the end, we, I am blind. However, I have a brain. Hala uses a walker, but you guys listen to what did she accomplish. And if you guys can put yourself in anybody's spot, and if you guys treat others exactly how you want to be treated, trust me, we would overcome a lot of these issues. Thank you. Thank you so much. Again, just all the snaps and <laughs> everything, because this has been so powerful just hearing from all of our panelists. We do have some questions, but I wanted to kind of link some threads of things that each of you have mentioned before we go to these questions, which some great questions. For those in the audience, too, if you do have more questions, um, feel free to add them to the Q&A right now so that I can take a look at them um, after this. So one thing that all of you stressed was education, right? Educating children, educating families, educating service providers, really focusing on those resources. And that's such a crucial aspect of this work is the education. So I really wanted to emphasize that for the audience as well, just really thinking about the action steps that have already been provided so far. Um, the other thing that was the focus was intent versus impact. And this comes up a lot in like social justice kind of spaces where we're thinking about the fact that you can have good intentions, but what is your impact on people? And so when people get offended where they're like, I was trying to pay you a compliment, I was trying to do this. I mean, these are things that are really harmful. They have a really harmful impact. And it's, um, as Hala mentioned, really shoring up this narrative around who disabled people are and this narrative around vulnerability and pity and all of these really loaded emotions that are completely uh, antithetical to especially our Islamic beliefs. Um, and so that was another thing too. And I wanted to segue with this to some of the questions is around you know, faith and spirituality and disability, especially as Muslims thinking about um, the work that we're doing and our, our own experiences with this. I know for myself as somebody with more of an invisible disability that has absolutely come up around hiding it, right? Passing, making sure you don't talk about it because people will then end up uh, thinking your chronic illness means you can't serve as a leader in a leadership position. You can't be trusted. You are not reliable. So many things and, and value judgments being placed on it. It's really critical that we work on this. So one thing that I wanted to ask before we move to the questions that are related to this is a little bit more about the role of spirituality. So Heather, you know, you mentioned this already a little bit, but I just wanted to give you all a chance to kind of address this and think about it. You know, as somebody who is Muslim, as somebody practicing um, 
what role does spirituality play in how you think about disability, how you approach disability justice in particular, um, and what are some thoughts that you want to share on that? And whoever wants to go first on that front. Uh, may I go first? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, unless somebody want to go first, I don't mean to, to jump in in front of anybody. You're good, you're good. All right, thank you. Um, so I touched on the, spir the, the spiritual part um, of my life because because I was raised in a God-fearing household, obviously, and I learned that there's no power stronger than God's. Having said that, God did place me in this awesome and the most blessing category. You might be thinking like now, you know, like you're saying that you're, like you're blind, you're saying that you're blessed. Yes, I am blessed, not in a way that I'm able to treat people from illnesses because this is another uh, misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. They think that blind people and, and, and a lot of Muslims, I'm not going to generalize. And this is nothing has to do with our religion, by the way. We have to distinguish between religion and culture. A lot of people think that, yeah, if you're blind and if you pray for God, you know, your answer, your prayers are going to be answered faster than, you know, the, the decided person, which is not true at all. I know that uh, a couple of friends of mine told me that one time they caught a huge mafia and the leader of that was a blind guy. <laughs> you know, it's off the topic, but I mean, not doesn't mean if you're blind, doesn't mean that you're not smart. I mean, that's again, you know, so going back to, to, to being spiritually strong and uh, connected, I mean, this is going to go also to sighted people or people that have invisible disabilities. So blindness in specifics, as I'm talking about myself, again, it does require patience and a lot of patience. What takes you 10 minutes to jump in your car and drive to your college is going to take me at least 20 or 25 minutes. That is the fastest using Uber. I mean, until I request my Uber, until it arrives at least seven minutes, eight minutes, until I jump in, I go there, that's another 10, 15 minutes. If, if he or she does not get lost, you know, I mean, so that's a very minor example that people often don't understand. And forget about that example. Just looking up the sky and enjoying the view of the birds, the water, the sky, what have you, God's beauty, God's creation. Another thing is having that strong connection that you're not going to lose faith. And you understand that there's going to be a better tomorrow. However, that better tomorrow is not going to come by itself. And, and you have to try and you have to fight for it. You have to earn it. You have to work towards it. And the second thing, and then I'm going to let the, my fellow panelists talk, so I don't mean to take over the conversation, is that we had learned from all of our prophets, especially Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that he was there for the underprivileged and the needy before anybody else. So as a political person myself, in public service and in advocacy, I do know that the culture and the nation and the society that are unable to accommodate the most underprivileged individuals, they are really in the failure classification. If we cannot accommodate, if we cannot empower, if we cannot pave the way for them to live in, with dignity and respect, we are not doing it right. Thank you. Thank you. Powerful stuff. Fatima, Hala? Um, may I? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Hopefully you'd like to. Um, okay. Um, so I think that in our community, a lot of people may equate, you know, what it means to be a good Muslim with like helping other people. And I mean, yes, all of our messengers and particularly our prophet, Muhammad, peace be upon him, advocated for helping others, alayhi salatu wasalam. But there's a difference between assuming you want to help others because you want to gain a hasana or a blessing and helping others because they actually need it. So I think there's like this narrative in our community or what I've encountered from my own, you know, social circle and my own family members is that, you know, they want to race to help me just so they can get a hasana. But I think to deconstruct that narrative, we need to look a little bit more as, we need to look a little bit more at why say our prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, you know, he advocated for helping people to to advocate and push for equality for all human beings not so you know people could get a hasana for 
for helping somebody with something that they already know how to do. You know, he, and I would also like to touch on what my fellow wonderful colleague Khudr um, said, that we, we are like, we, we deserve or deserve to live with dignity. So we, we deserve, he, alayhi salatu tried to ensure access for, for all individuals. And I think, and I think that accommodating people instead of assuming what they need help with would be much more, would, would be much more constructive to the cause. Than, than just assuming that somebody needs help and being like, okay, I want a hasana, so I'm going to help this person. No, no. Alayhi salatu wasalam wanted you to accommodate us so that we can get the resources we need, not so you can race to us thinking that we need help just to get a, just for you to get a hasana. I'm sorry, it doesn't work like that. If your intention is just to get a hasana, that's actually not, that's it that actually goes against what you were trying to do in the first place. Because Alayhi Salatu Wasalam believed that everybody should live with dignity, not that somebody should decide, you know, how, you know, how that person should, you know, should interact with others or not, or should be living or not. You know, like, or not, not so other people can decide, oh, this person needs help. Let me go, you know, play the good Muslim and help them out. And again, I'm sorry, I don't mean to like, you know, bash anybody again. <laughs> I don't mean to offend anybody. I'm just saying that like intent versus impact, like Namira said, your intent might be might be pure and, and might be, you know, wonderful, but the impact of it is is more severe than than you intended. And so I'd much rather that somebody help me get accommodations in order for me to get what I need independently than for somebody to assume that I need help just because they see me using a walker. Thank you. Powerful. Thanks, Fatima. Um, yeah, so I think when it comes to the question of the role that religion or faith plays in how we view disability, it's a complex one. And there's not a straight answer. On one hand, you have the way that the Quran describes disability and the way that it is um, like portrayed in the context of you know, the Quran and Hadith. And more or less, it's neutral. So it's neither positive nor negative. It just is there. And then you have the interpretation um, how some people interpret those ayahs, um, maybe how culture also plays into the role of how we interpret religion in regards to disability. So on the one hand, you have people who will say that disability is a curse and therefore um, it is stigmatized. And um, it, if you have a disability, it must be because you have your parents did something bad and therefore Allah has cursed you, you know? And that obviously is problematic because it excludes people with disabilities from, first of all, being able to access services that they need. Um, and it alienates them from within their own communities. Oftentimes, there are families that don't even tell extended family that they have a child with disability. And so that really kind of like shrinks the world of the immediate family of that person and of that person um, himself, because there's not a support network. And so we have problems with, with coping because there's not a support net, um, network. We might have problems with um, depression and um, other issues like that. Now, it's not all doom and gloom because as, as Khudr mentioned, Brother Khudr mentioned, how he views his own blindness as um, you know, in regards to his faith, it's just, he, he, it's not something negative. It just is. And, you know, we try to kind of, um, accept that this is Qadr and for that means, um, something that is predestined or preordained, which is, which is a very, uh, foundational belief in Islam. So when you view it like that as something that's, preordained or something from God, something that exists within the diversity of, of humans, 
then it's not so bad. And you just learn to live with it. You say, Alhamdulillah, if, if it's your child, you say Alhamdulillah. And I want to um, also just make mention of the fact that, you know, there's a hadith that says, put your trust in Allah, but tie up your camel. And so it allows people who um, believe in, in, in that to take an active role in whether it's policy change or whether it's um, their education or whether it's going out and um, seeking services. Um, it gives them an active role. It um, allows them to see themselves as free agents rather than just taking a passive role in um, their family members or their own um, disability. So um, there's that. So I think when it comes to faith and religion, it can be either a good thing or a bad thing with how we view it. Um, and I just want to say that again, like we are all created, <laughs> you know, Allah said that he created, you know, tribes and nations of us so that we may get to know one, one another. That doesn't just include race, it includes disability. And for those of us who were blessed to be born able-bodied and, um, uh, and it's not through any merit of our own. And that doesn't make us superior to someone who is not able-bodied. It's, it's just a simply a, a way we exist. And so with that, I say, you know, if, if you're blessed to be born with your full faculties and you are able-bodied, what are you doing with that? What are you doing with that? Are you using it to, um, are, are you using it to do things that are helpful? <laughs> you know, so, so like uh, Sister Hala said, um, are you using it to accommodate? Are you using it to educate? What are you using your abilities for? So inshallah, it's for the good. And again, we all have strengths, whether you have a disability or not, we all have strengths. And so look at those strengths to uplift each other. And um, again, Hala, as you said, you know, accommodate one another. Um, and Brother Khadr, like, go to your government and, you know, be, in, be active. So um, I guess that's, and as far as, like, spaces and masjids and inclusion, like, it, it also plays a role in that, right? We, it, I was noticing in, in, you know, some of the chat, some people were asking about, you know, how do we include people in spaces of worship? The fact that we're not doing it already is a problem. It's problematic why are we not doing it and how can we improve it? And I think it starts with educating the Muslim communities about, you know, what the Quran says about disability, what the Hadith says about disability and um, opening these spaces to make them more accommodating for everybody to be able to participate. So I, I, it's, it's, the problem is not within the disability itself that prevents people from being able to participate in spaces of worship. The problem is in how we allow accessibility to spaces of worship and um, and opening up um, communities to accommodate for individuals with disabilities and special needs. Thank you. And you segue so well into this question around like religious spaces, especially like masjid, community centers and making those more in inclusive and reducing stigma. And it really reminded me of kind of the erasures that happened too. I mean, people often talk about when it comes to like racism and Muslim spaces about, you know, Bilal Radhi Allah being the first person to, to call the Adhan from the Kaaba, right? And I, it took, it was a while before I heard the story that the second person to call the Adhan was a blind man. And that's not something that is often talked about in terms of the fact that accessibility is where we should be focusing and not on the disability being a barrier in and of itself. It's really just the accessibility that is not happening. Um, and just, the other, yeah, go ahead. No, I'm sorry, I, I, didn't, I didn't mean to cut you off, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say like, you know, when it comes to some of the blessings, blessings can be tests in and of themselves. So for somebody who has um, who is able-bodied, like this is a test, right? Like, what are you going to be doing with this? Um, and especially, are you contributing to the erasure or the stigmatization of people who have disabilities, who have cha challenges? Are you making sure that you are paying attention to this? So Heather, go ahead. Thank you. I just wanted uh, to highlight just a couple of things. Um, so when I mentioned that uh, blindness is a blessing, uh, I just wanted to emphasize a little bit more about what I meant by that. So it gave me the opportunity to look at things from a way deeper lens, 
meaning I don't care about what kind of house you are living in. I don't really care about what kind of car you're driving. I don't really care how you look. What I do care about is your heart, your morals, your principles, and the mutual respect and trust that we build you know, as we go. Having said that, it also gave me the opportunity, okay, to feel with the needy and the underprivileged. Because if I myself know what hardship is, I'm certainly, when I reach a certain situation of comfort, I am expected religiously, ethically, morally, and from a humanitarian background to give back and to aid those who are in struggle because I was among them one day. We should not forget how we were and where we came from. And again, this is really, we're not doing anybody a favor. If we claim to be Muslims, real Muslims by actions, not by intentions or just by titles, we have to practice that. And this is one of the major pillars. That's why we have Khumas and Zakat. You know, it's not to go and blast it on social media and inform the world that we donated $5 or $5,000. It's really to empower those that are in need without shaming them and without, you know, putting them in a spot that they feel that they are less dignified. Another thing is with regards to the second blind, to the second uh, person who gave what I found then. And that's another thing that I do struggle with myself oftentimes. Like, believe it or not, believe it or not, guys, when I'm not putting on a suit and a tie, just like in my casual, people think that I do nothing at all. People think, unless they know me, unless they've seen me on social media, at a newspaper, at a television interview, at a webinar, uh, on, a, on a commercial, because I started doing that as well. I filmed two commercials, um, you know, lately, um, you know, but those who do not know me from the first, you know, minute, just like what Hala says, they assume that I do nothing and I collect social security, which is nothing wrong with that. I'm not, you know, trying to say that this is bad, but they think that I can't work and I can't do nothing. On the other hand, even strangers who do not know me, yeah, absolutely. They do acknowledge my disability because I have a white cane and I am blind, which I'm so proud of. However, when they see me in a suit and a tie, they think I'm, a, and I'm an educator, I'm a lawyer or what have you. So it's really, how, it's really incredible how people, you know, vision and uh, can really fool them. And with regards to the mosques, I think that we have to shift um, you know, as imams, as, you know, people, the worshipers. I think we have to shift the discussion, you know, same thing in the households, from being pity and just from being blessed, you know, uh, to treat, you know, individuals with disabilities in a pity way. I can tell you from my, on my, on my behalf, I do not allow anybody with all due respect, but certainly in a very respectful manner. I don't allow anybody to abuse, you know, my, um, my, like my comfort zone. I'm not gonna allow anybody to make me feel less or, or, or lower. Why? Because they have nothing, nothing, because I have nothing that make me do that. I mean, I went to school like everybody else. I pursued my education. I work, I pay taxes. I'm a very productive citizen. I'm very involved, very engaged, very active. So, this is very important too. We have to stand up for our own concerns and issues. It's really important to be nice and respectful, of course, because that's the only way how we can, you know, change somebody's mind, not through fighting and arguing and going through that, you know, uh, dead end. That's what I just wanted to share with you guys that we have to change that, you know, people often tell me, oh, you're blind, so do you, do you receive the Quran? So, well, of course, I don't read the Quran, but that's not my that's not my job. God did not ask us to come to this world just to read the Quran and sit at home, eat and drink and sleep. That's not simply a productive way of living. If anybody accept that on their self, I'm going to accept it. And just one last example, Munir. I'm sorry, I'm taking a lot of your time. One time, I was I was on the Senate floor, and I was debating with a senator about unemployment rate among individuals with disabilities. Now, this is, a, this is an issue. As a disabled population, we have a responsibility to get out there, pursue our education, and conquer the world. But on the other hand, we have to encourage and fight and advocate and lobby the policymakers and the employers and all the business owners to pave the way for us as well. Now, one time somebody was telling me, yeah, but you guys, um, a lot of you guys collect SSI, social, social, social security disability. 
or income, supplemental income. I said, okay, I told them, if you can live on a $750 a month comfortably, I'm gonna rest my case right here from Washington, DC. And I'm gonna tell all my buddies, all my fellow challenge individuals, you guys are making a fortune every month. Go sit at home and don't say a word. And then what was his response? Simply nothing. What he's gonna say, can he live off uh, 750 a month? Who can, all right, who can with paying rent, bills, expenses, especially again, as I touched on earlier, as disabled people, we have a lot of extra expenses due to our accommodations. My MacBook cost me $1,300. If someone who is sighted, if they have the luxury of buying it, good for them, but they don't need it. I need it as a blind person because it has a built-in talking program. 10 years ago, not for making a commercial for them, but Verizon was the only company that really housed iPhones which also are Apple products, which means that they also have a built-in talking program. Back then, it used to cost me two times more the bill than it is today, simply because all the companies now obviously have iPhones. So as you can tell, with the unemployment rate that is among the disabled population, which is considered a minority within a minority as Muslims in the States and the world, you know, I mean, talking in general, uh -huh. all right? We have a lot of barriers, but we have to stand up for these barriers and we have to, just, you know, rise on top of one at a time. Sorry, I take a lot of your time. Thank you. No, thank you. And I think that's such an important point around like the cost, right? And the ways people place the burden back on the individual and not on the system. So now, I mean, that just reminds me, it's like nowadays we have Alexa and all these various programs that people are using voice activated and it's seen as kind of an easy thing to do. And even within COVID space, right? Certain accommodations that were just not doable before, all of a sudden we're able to do this virtually. We're able to do um, certain things that, you know, people said we can't do this via virtual, we have to come in person. And those barriers are suddenly, now that it's a necessity, able to be um, shifted. So it's really important. I think tied to that too, um, there was a question around, I wanted to, so there's a couple of questions that I wanna to pair together. Uh, so I hope that's okay for those who ask the questions. Um, one of the questions, a couple of the questions were around resources in particular. So what support is there for you know, Muslim families, um, the gaps, uh, are there Muslim specific resources or support groups that you know, the panelists you would recommend for those who are you know, Muslims with disabilities, families that have somebody who has a disability. So what resources are out there? And Fatima, um, I thought I'd go to you first, yeah. Yeah, um, so I'm gonna talk about Mohsen. If you want to visit the website, it's mohsen.org. That's M-U-H-S-E-N.org. This is a nonprofit organization that is dedicated to the inclusion of people with disabilities and the education of the community at large. Um, one of their biggest programs is the uh, mosque certification program. So it, there's three levels of certification. And in order for a mosque to be certified, they have to meet certain standards at each level. So at the first level, which is a silver certification, you simply need to hold an awareness event. Or, uh, I believe it's two awareness events. You need to give two khutbas or sermons on Friday. Um, and you also need to have um, uh, like um, ADA compliant um, the physical mosque, so parking spaces, uh, ramps, elevators, etc. Um, and a muhsin will help to support you in, in getting those um, or working around somehow making those spaces more accessible. At the next level, there they there's also things like um, holding parent support groups with someone who is licensed. And um, I know that they, now they have a peer buddy program. Um, at the mosque that I work, I facilitate at the Muslim Unity Center here, we were able to acquire a Braille Quran. We're working on also getting um, ASL translations for some of the events that we have. Um, we also have social events. So we had an Eid drive through event for um, families with children with disabilities. Um, and we, uh, we were able to reach out and get more families on board who didn't know about this resource before. Um, they also provide a respite care, not during COVID, but uh, during regular times, there's respite care. So if, if, if families need someone to come and take over for a bit while they go out and run errands, or you know, there's an event at the mosque, they, they have respite care workers who will sit with your child while you are able to attend an event. Um, 
some other services that they have are um, uh, a weekend school. So um, a weekend school that is taught by special education teachers um, and or this, the staff is trained by special education teachers. They have their own curriculum. Right now during COVID, they're doing it via Zoom. So um, they're doing a lot for the community. I highly recommend you go visit their website and check it out. And um, if you have a child with a disability or if you are someone, um, you can also reach out to a peer buddy, someone just to socialize with because these can be very lonely times for all of us. Um, Another big, big program that they have is their Mohsen Omra. So um, to help these, the families of these um, people with special needs or the um, individuals themselves who wouldn't otherwise be able to go and perform Omra or pilgrimage on their own, they have a team that goes out with them. So again, they provide respite care. They, um, they, they um, accompany them on the Amro journey and they have healthcare providers and um, people with all different backgrounds and experience. So um, check it out. That is one big resource. Um, they've been around for a few years and mashallah, they're growing a lot. So um, yeah, check it out. And Hala, do you have any other resources or recommendations sure. um, uh, for people or other? Yeah, either one of you for, for Muslim specific resources. Hala, I wanna go first. Um, well, I mean, I'm not really informed on the resources. Like, this is no, that's totally fine. Yeah. I wanted to make sure that I, I'm, not, to... I'm not like blocking you off. That's all. That's why I'm. <laughs> um, oh, no, no, don't worry about it. I I'd love to hear you. what you have to say. No worries. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Fatme, of course, thank you so much for all the great stuff that you guys offer. I think, to be honest with you guys and all the audience uh, that is in attendance today, the number one thing, the number one resource, believe it or not, that we often overlook or even don't think about is inclusion. Are this all are all these activities? This is not this is not for you, Fatima. I'm not asking you, sir. I don't mean like to put you on the spot, but this is really the question that I ask even that I asked on Henry Ford College campus when I led that change uh, project, even the question that I asked when I led the multi-year project on the University of Michigan uh, campus. Um, all, are all these initiatives, events, are all the ideas that we think about are actually going to promote inclusion? Because see that the problem, we often organize some stuff for the disabled population and they often being like singled out, you know, or in a lot of cases, they are not integrated into the large community. So what a good thing we're offering, I mean, of course, besides providing the service itself, and again, I'm not, I'm not really targeting anybody here, but because as a blind person myself, I've been through it. And I've been blind all my life. I'm 27 years, so trust me, I've been through it many times. Now, if we organize something for the disabled population, whether blind, autism, or anything like that, how the non-blind or the, not, the sighted people, the people that are not familiar with autism will understand and learn that these individuals are not any different in a bad way from us. So I really encourage inclusion and diversity because the disabled population is a major part of the social, political, economic, and cultural fabric of the society. You know, I mean, we are not any different. We are diversity. Disability is diversity. That's number one. Number two, we do have a lot of organizations. I mean, it depends on the uh, disability. Um, if somebody is blind, obviously, we have a state agency called the Bureau of Service for Blind Persons. Uh, they assist the blind student um, or the legally blind student or even the low vision a student from high, from K through 12, and then they follow up um, after after high school graduation. If somebody with a developmental disability, also uh, we have a state agency being deaf as well. I'm working now currently on um, creating a Wayne County wide uh, commission uh, that takes care of the disabled population. Believe it or not, believe it or not, we have about 14 to 15 percent of Wayne County population are are labeled as disabled. We have almost 2 million disabled residents in the state of Michigan. Who is taking care of all this issue from a policy perspective? That is why myself and our state representative, Abdullah Hamoud here uh, in Dearborn, big shout out to him and everybody who's working on this project. We are trying to reactivate the State of Michigan Commission on Disability Concerns that was dissolved back in 2012. And this commission is not sought or ought to provide services and accommodations as much as 
it provides insights and ideas and suggestions to the government um, you know, leadership, meaning to the governor office and to the state legislature. So by having these uh, services-based organizations alongside the public policy and advocacy organizations and the legal aid, meaning the attorneys and justices and judges, I think we are gonna reach a more inclusive society because we need to take care of everything from its uh, aspect. We cannot take care of the service you know, side of the issue and then forget about the advocacy and vice versa. So inclusion, inclusion, inclusion is very huge. That's really what I really admire about the school system in the States is that uh, although we do have a room called the VI room, which stands for visually impaired, yet the students that don't need you know, much of transcribing help or you know, converting anything that is visual to braille or, or audio, they are attending general ed uh, classes like everybody else, except the fact that, you know, we used to use a computer, which now everybody is using a computer, especially with the pandemic. But even before the pandemic, obviously everything has shifted to technology. So I just wanted to uh, focus on this. It's really that we need to ask, yes, the disabled related population, um, I'm sorry, uh, services and, and, and resources are not much well promoted. And that's really what I touch on all the time, that we have to promote um, our services, our accommodations, our organization, and we have to support them. And uh, let's do that. Again, I'm more than happy to cooperate with anybody. Thank you. Thanks. And I think that's such a comprehensive answer too, right? With, oh, uh, we lost Hella for a second. She'll be back. Uh, but thinking about the fact that it's a comprehensive strategy, all of it. Oh, okay, good. You're still there. Okay, great. Yeah. So really thinking about like comprehensive strategies. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Sorry, yes. Uh, no, please, please go ahead. Comprehensive strategies in regards to... Yeah, it regrets to change, right? So it's like starting, we've talked about starting with families. We've talked about thinking about the organizations and the service providers, and then thinking about the policy aspect and the advocacy work that needs to be done on that wider kind of governmental level. So I really appreciate the levels of this. And Hala, one thing I wanted to kind of amplify too before we pivot to kind of probably our final questions looking at the time um, was around kind of your work with like the Dearborn Coalition and then also with the Detroit Health Department. I'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit to kind of the work that's being done around both the governmental level of things, but then also like the personal coalition side. Um, well, actually that ties into exactly what I was gonna say. Can Perfect. you hear me or should okay. I call in? <laughs> <laughs> I, I can do, I, I mean, can you hear me or should I call in? I can do either. No, we can hear you. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Cool. Cool. So I think what I learned from my time at the Detroit Health Department, especially because we talked a lot about mental health and the stigma around substance use, but I think it can be applied to the disability community as well. Meeting people where they're at, A, so offering like you know, like social services or, or like just like physical services or what have you, because some of these families may not be on, may not be insured. So they may not have the, the means to access these services, just the offering like some sort of like, you know, financial services or just like ways or grants for people to apply to in order for them to be able to access certain services, or maybe like if there was free services um, you know, centered around disability advocacy or, or things of that nature, or, you know, like not even, well, I'm sorry, not even disability advocacy, but like healthcare services, like, you know, that are free and that are available to like vulnerable families or marginalized families, especially with regard to the pandemic, you know, a lot of people face income loss and job loss. So added to the stigma, we also have this component of like financial struggle. Um, so that's one. Two, I think in order to have person-centered care, we need to like have people like look like me, people that look like me and brother Fodor and you know, I, I, I know that you mentioned that you might've had an invisible disability if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Just, just people with, you know, like combination, like a diversity, like a plethora of people and then a, a diversity, like a diverse, I, I guess, collection of people I don't want to say collection, group, group. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm a little flustered because of the internet connection. But anyway, um, so, you know, a diverse group of people that can speak to the area that we're serving, 
You get what I'm saying? So they can speak to the disability community. If I see someone that looks like me in positions of power, it eliminates the power dynamic. I know I can open up to you because you've been in my shoes. You're, you're going to give me an empathetic and uh, non-judgmental view of what I'm going through and what you know we've all been going through. You're, you're going to find unity in our struggle, and you're going to help me find the resources I need if you've been through similar struggles that I have been in. So I think it speaks a lot to people. And, you know, even like at the health department, I attended this, you know, three day, yeah, it was a three day conference around, you know, uh, the stigma around substance use and, and things like that. And we talked about a meeting people where they're at. So not imposing any form of treatment on them and kind of just gradually just implementing those treatment services as they need or as they want. And also just having people who look like them represent them. Because if I see someone who represents me in a position of power, I'm gonna be more motivated to go to them because they've been through what I've been through. I, you know, I don't like, honestly, I don't, I'm not like a big fan of having like somebody who's, you know, you know, like, you know, like, unversed at like how to deal with like disability you know people with disabilities and whatnot or like you know like I've had doctors who would ask me you know who you know Arab Muslim doctors who would you know be treating me for something but they would like look at my walker first and again it goes back to this you know this narrative that you know we need to stop looking at disability first a and we need to make sure that there are more people who look like us in these position of power so that we don't feel stigmatized or shamed trying to access these resources. Thank you. You addressed one of the questions that was in the Q&A around like, how can we help service providers recognize and understand our intersections? And I think you completely touched on it because there's such a wide variety when it comes to disability and when it comes to barriers and challenges that having that representation really means so much. So there's a couple questions that I wanted to pivot to. And before we do that, I wanted to, in the interest of thinking about disability and accessibility, just encourage people to stretch a little bit and take some breaths with me. So that way we can, we can have that a little bit and just get, you know, do some stretching, stretch your hands, whatever you can, whatever you need. Um, and then let's take some breaths together. So let's take a deep breath in and out. Another deep breath in and out. And last one, deep breath in and out. I want to make sure that in spaces where we talk about disability, we also change the format sometimes, right? In terms of how people are sitting and how people are having to be in the space. So I wanted to just encourage that um, as we head into this last section. So this is like a big topic, but I'm wondering if we could get perspectives on this. So the questions are, there's two of them, and I'm going to pair them together around like Islamophobia and ableism. So especially, you know, challenges within the disabled community, one person asked around challenges within the disabled community around perceptions or misconceptions about Muslims, but then also how do Islamophobia and ableism intersect? So how are those like the lived reality of being both disabled and Muslim? How does that play out? What are some experiences within disabled spaces? What are some experiences of just seeing both of those things layered on top of each other? Sure, may I go first? Yes, go ahead. Um, thank you. So these are great questions because as an advocate and public policymaker, I was really, and I'm still really blessed to attend so many um, occasions and different functions in the state of Michigan and throughout the states in a place or a conference where there are no Arabs or Muslims and even no disabled people. And I believe that these three factors, uh, you know, really make me even more um, you know, interested to keep up with the work that I do and to support every organization or advocate or public policymaker or public official that, you know, they all collectively lead um, such work. So 
one point is one time I was um, in the state of, um, of Alabama um, attending um, a conference and um, I was the only Muslim for sure. I know that by heart because I literally met everybody who was in attendance. There were about two, 300 people and we didn't break into many sessions and uh, throughout lunch and even afterward, uh, like in the restaurant and the hotel and stuff like that. And believe it or not, you know, they asked me as much as questions about my disability, but also about being Muslim and what does it feel like to be a Muslim, um, you know, and we touched on so many things from the political aspect to the misunderstanding to the stigma to, you know, Muslim women, can they do this, can they do that, and how is being disabled in the Muslim thing, like one time somebody asked me, oh, uh, if you, I mean, you're a Muslim, and if you have a, you know, blind or deaf or somebody in a wheelchair who is also born like that, do you guys kill them? I said, not at all. You know, I said, wow. um, Islam, yeah, I said, Islam, see, that goes back to education. I mean, I tell them Islam, not because I'm Muslim, but I'm pretty sure just like all the other religions, you know, um, Islam is a very, um, you know, you know, it, it's, 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 I mean, it's a very merciful, um, you know, platform. I mean, we really encourage nothing but love, kindness, mercy, forgiveness, um, and love and, uh, and, and, and passion. So, um, Myself being in that position um, of being blind, Arab, Muslim, person of color, I think that placed me really at a great position to speak for that. And let me tell you, I invited uh, many of, uh, of these um, you know, individuals to Dearborn, um, you know, the, the, the beloved city of Dearborn, and they came over and they tried our food. And I really organized a tour among the mosques and the churches and the restaurants and the Henry Ford uh, estate. and you know, Greenfield Village, and uh, believe it or not, now they eat uh, Middle Eastern food more than I do. So, uh, <laughs> you know, seriously, um, it takes that uh, step forward to warmly and cordially um, invite them to explore something new, try something new. And uh, same thing goes back to disability. Um, Hala, we are not going to reach a time where we are going to say, yay, we are 110% included. However, whether that person in power has a disability or not, we have to remain vocal. We have to remain strong. We have to remain, um, you know, consistent because consistency in advocacy uh, goes hand in hand with reaching the goal. If you just speak up about one matter and you don't really follow up on that, yeah, they're gonna forget it. So I just wanted to emphasize on that too. But yeah, this is a really awesome experience to be in such a situation that you're not going to find anybody like every single day going through that same thing. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And how the same similar question around like intersections of Islamophobia and ableism, you know, experiences within the disabled kind of different community spaces around being Muslim or misconceptions around being Muslim in those spaces. Um, well, for me, I guess like, um, you know, like I've, well, when I was a little kid, I mean, this is the most like, this is like the most like, um, I want to say prevalent incident in my mind because I, you know, I don't like, I, I don't look Muslim. So I, you know, I'm not veiled obviously. So you know, people might think, you know, at first glance when they look at me, they might think, oh, you know, you're, you know, white or you're, you know, what have you, or, you know, the, their first assumption isn't Muslim because I, I mean, while I, I identify as a, I do identify as a practicing Muslim, I don't present myself as such. So a lot of people might think, oh, you know, you're, you know, they might assume that I'm Christian or, or what have you. But like, I remember, um, and speaking of visibility, I remember when I was a little kid, um, I was told not to speak a Arabic in front of like, you know, in, in school or in, you know, in classrooms, because it was like post 9-11. And like, people just did not want me to make my Islam or my Arabness known in any way, shape or form, just because of the violent rhetoric that was happening around that time like it was like it, there was a lot of tension happening at that time but it's like you know being muslim and being arab is is a part of who i am and you know it was very hard not to embrace i thought okay you know you know i'm you know i'm muslim i'm proud i've been threatened i've been praying since i was really young and things like that but it's just 
I understand that if I got, like, if I veiled right now, if I chose to, like, wear a hijab right now, I would be a lot more visible as a Muslim woman with a disability. And then the assumption would be like, oh, you know, like, I, and I hear this from my, you know, able-bodied counterparts who have hijab, whether they're able-bodied or not, who wear hijab, that, oh, you know, you were, you know, some of the rhetoric might be, oh, you were you forced to wear that? Did somebody, you know, force you to, like, put on hijab suddenly? Like, because the, the rhetoric, rhetoric around hijab is that oh you know like some of the dominant rhetoric around it especially in, in western media is that it's op oppressive when really it's actually a declaration of of a woman's islam and, and a declaration of her i mean depending on the interpretation declaration of her modesty and her devotion to to her religion so you know it could mean a lot of things to a lot of people and um, I just think that, you know, there are certain things about me that if they change today or tomorrow, like, and if I mark myself as a Muslim, I would be subjugated to a lot more like, you know, like, of the dominant narrative around Islam. And I would be like seen as like a visible Muslim woman with a disability, like most of like the stigma in, in, you know, that I face as a result of, a, of my disability comes from within my own community. There are like questions that are asked, you know, in the Western community about my disability, but they make it clear that I, they're just curious. Mm. You know, they, they, they tell me right then and there, you know, just curious what, what kind of disability you have because I, you know, what kind of disability do you have? Because I'd like to learn more about what I can do to increase my advocacy. And I mean this in no, in no offense to my community. I really, I, I love my community. I love being Arab, I love being Muslim. But I just think that there are certain things and certain markers that, high, you know, that mark us as Muslim women. And for me, it's just like, you know, my religion isn't as hyper visible because I, don't present as the typical Muslim that people think, you know, I don't present as the Muslim that, you know, people in the West, you know, predominantly think of when they, when they think of Muslim women. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And I feel like, I mean, it also goes to the stereotypes too, that like, oh, if, if, if somebody is Muslim, like she has to look a certain way, she has to dress a certain way. And then that erasure of people's Muslim faith yeah. too, which is really, really frustrating. Yeah. Um, so yeah, thank you both. I know yeah. we're right at the end for time. So I feel like there's still some really important questions. Um, so I think what we'll do is, is I'll see if maybe in the chat, uh, a couple of you could answer some of the questions. Um, but I wanted to make sure to respect people time and, and you know it's a Saturday so thank you so much we've had so many participants just, just one last comment if you don't yeah, mind yeah and I wanted to Please. give the panelists a chance to, to do some closing remarks so Sorry, I wanted just... to thank yeah I wanted to thank uh you're good I wanted to thank um the people for like kind of in the chats and the questions and just really thoughtful thoughtfulness with it so with that let me turn it over to our panelists so you can provide some closing remarks um address anything else that's on your mind and then we will close out so close do you want to go first? No, I'll go last. I'll go last. Okay, that sounds good. Fatima or Hal, whoever wants to go first. Okay, I, I can go. Okay. So I just wanted to close with some things that the, you know, the Muslim community can do to reach justice um, or what people can do to contribute to um, disability justice. So first of all, I'm finding that there is not a lot of research, like at all, as far as, um, Muslims with disabilities. Research on, on Muslims in the, in the United States is uh, very low. And then research on Muslims with disabilities is even lower. So we need to know more about the experience of this group in you know, attaining intervention, what their um, experience is like in getting so, you know, special education services, healthcare. Um, we need to know more about the outcomes of those who are served. Um, we also need more research about, um, in order to develop more effective strategies to get them in the door to early intervention services and to keep them there. Um, so what kind of culturally sensitive practices are we doing or not doing 
um, and, and we need to hone in on those things through research. Um, we also need to recruit Muslims into the field focused on serving people with special needs and disabilities. So we're talking teachers, therapists, uh, behavior analysts, so on and so forth. Um, and this can be done just by recruiting people um, through like um, Muslim student associations, um, get them even younger, like high schools, you know, there's all the, all, all the time there's career fairs. So, I mean, here in Detroit, we have high schools that are predominantly Muslim. So we should target high schools like that and allow these, um, you know, young people to explore careers in, um, in fields where they're gonna be encountering people with disabilities. Also creating more volunteer opportunities get them also to um, maybe uh, go into the, you know, the mosques and have the mosques actually interact with the larger communities. So there's, you know, always opportunities for things like 5Ks, buddy walk, autism walk, you can create a team and kind of go in there. And just to kind of open up people to um, who people with disabilities are, uh, what their needs are, and maybe get into a career. Um, and then for providers, for like non-Muslim providers specifically, to be able to practice cultural humility. So oftentimes I'm, it, it's the case where well, Western culture is the standard by which we measure success of different um, minority groups. And if a minority group deviates from the standard, we see them as deficient rather than considering the complex factors that may play into um, their experiences. So it's important to see how like the context of religion, ethnicity, gender, socioeconomic status and culture play into attitudes surrounding disability that ultimately impact the outcome for treatment. And with that said, it's also important to recognize that these factors impact people at the individual level to varying degrees. So even though we may share a common religion, there's also a lot of nuances that play into how um, the individual um, attitudes and beliefs so it's important to treat them as individuals and not paint them with a broad brush. So, um, and then, you know, just for service providers, just recognize your own biases and be prepared to challenge them. Listen, like, like really listen to your patients um, and because you won't always know what's best for them. You may know, you, 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 you know, recognize that what you think is best for them is coming from a place of, of your own bias but that might not always work out for the, um, the patient or the client or the student that you're serving. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's more than just knowing that Muslims don't eat pork. You know, you have to know all about the complex, um, the barriers, first of all, and then the complex um, factors that um, play into their, their experiences and um, what's important to them. And then finally, we do need to hone our efforts into doing away with stigma. And this for me is a big, big one. So it's a huge, a complex undertaking, but it's certainly worthwhile. So, you know, just to give an example of things that um, Mohsen's already doing, um, focusing on educating the community. So again, like I mentioned, just to reiterate, either through the Friday chuppahs and sermons, um, youth trainings um, and, uh, you know, including people with disabilities in spaces of worship so that it's normalized. It's not something that's, um, that's, that's different or strange to, to see someone with a disability there, but it's just, it should just be something that's typical. And um, so, you know, in, in, just in, more efforts to include them. Um, so I think that um, starting with, you know, educating the Muslim community is, is going to be huge. Thanks so much. Khaled, did you want to have any like closing thoughts and especially, yeah, like what can, what can people do kind of thinking forward goals to get to a place with more disability justice? Oh, and she might be frozen. <laughs> oh, Khaled's internet. There we go. Okay, great. I think you're back. You're yes, can everyone hear there me? We go. Okay. Yep, now we can hear you. Yes. Um, so again, sorry, what was the question? Because I've been trying to work yeah. out the whole 
Yeah, it was around like closing thoughts. So anything that's still on your mind that you want to make sure to say. And then, yeah, thinking about like greater disability justice. How can we, you know, what are some things that people can keep in mind as we kind of wrap up this conversation? I definitely agree with Fatima 100%, Sister Fatima. Um, we definitely need to have more like social workers and behavioral health analysts and just, uh, you know, just services that are sensitive to, you know, people's needs with a disability and, you know, like letting go of our biases really, like just, just coming into this with like a perspective of, I wanna be as inclusive as you, of your needs as possible, but I also wanna recognize your, your agency and your power of, you know, the power of your choice, you know, and the, your power to make your own decisions. So I definitely think like we, again, we need to let go of bias and we need to let go of this standard of success because like the, or do, the dominant standard of success, because a lot of people, you know, may see me and may think, you know, like Khudr mentioned earlier, you know, if I'm not speaking on a panel or, you know, if I'm not like attending school, then people don't think I'm capable of doing anything or people automatically think, oh, you know, she's not going to school because she's, you know, vulnerable or, you know, she, she's not able to comprehend a lot of the topics that are, you know, that are, um, I want to say, that are discussed in academic circles, which I think is a very, very um, skewed assumption. <laughs> and I think that these, like, skewed assumptions of people with disabilities, again, we can't just like look at somebody and assume their capability and assume their power of choice. We, we really have to like, you know, touch, you know, we really have to touch on like what they want for themselves because in order to treat them as dignified human beings, we have to like give people just the chance to, to, you know, see where, you know, they're, you know, they're, these, services might lead for them, you know, or and things like things of that nature. Um, and I also believe that we need to incorporate the topic of disability in mainstream Muslim settings, such as, you know, khutbahs like um, Sister Fatima mentioned, inclusion into our circles. We need to stop trying to bury it under the rug and, and automatically assume that, oh, this is too shameful for the family, you know, just, you know, cause again, they're like, and I didn't get to touch on this as like, I think Khudur mentioned earlier too, that, you know, there's this common narrative that, you know, those who were born with a disability, like it's a form of punishment when really like, you know, it varies, you know, in interpretation for everyone, but, you know, I, like Brother Khudr, see my disability as a blessing because it enabled me to identify the needs of those most vulnerable and marginalized populations in a way that's constructive, in a way that doesn't look down upon them, in a way that includes all people of all races, of all abilities. And I think if people could just see that we are agenic individuals who are capable of, of anything that, you know, we would like to see for ourselves. I think that that would be like really, really helpful and constructive in, in advancing and alleviating the advocacy journey for, for a lot of us and advancing towards positive social change. Thank so, you. Um, with that, I will close and I'd like to apologize again for my connectivity issues. You but um, thank you so much, Namita, for your wonderful moderation skills and your, your engaging points of discussion. I mean, they really, really, you know, motivated me to think more about like what I wanted to say and how I wanted to frame this. And I, I really, really appreciate you so much. I appreciate my fellow panelists, the MDRC, Amr, 
Brianna, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I am so grateful to all of you for this beautiful initiative and for allowing me to, you know, contribute in, in this manner. And I really, really hope that, you know, when we all put our hands together and unite and, you know, we all have this inclusive centered vision in our minds that we are able to dismantle uh, oppressive structures uh, in the disability community. Thank you so much. I mean, thank you. And then last but not least, Kohler, please. Sure. Kohler, can you hear me? Out. Yes, we can hear you. Um, I would like to thank you, Namira, for being an awesome moderator. I want to thank Almer and Brianna and the uh, Michigan Disability Rights Coalition for putting such an awesome event. And I think such events should remain continuous to the throughout the entire year. See, that's another thing. Like October is Disability Awareness Month. And I always ask the city of Dearborn, and the state of Michigan even, what is it that they are doing to acknowledge that, to recognize that October is Disability Awareness Month? Today is a world um, you know, day like for a mental health you know, celebration. And that is part of you know, the, you know, the disability discussion. And certainly we cannot only solve our issues and overcome our barriers on through talks, but these are a great and opening and an eye-opening uh, steps towards you know, the next step. So, the first thing is we have to keep on educating. We have to keep on spreading the good word, the positivity, the good attitude, the inspiration in a sense that is realistic, not only just complimenting and clapping, you know, and then when it comes to the real talk, like an employer, for example, keeps on complimenting somebody with a disability, but then when it comes for them to employ them and, you know, pave the way for them, instead of them being handed the fish, teach them how to hunt, at that point, trust me, a lot of employers will back up. I said, well, then why you keep complimenting? I mean, just let's stick to our truth. Let's really pave the way through our actions. Personally, as an advocate, as a public speaker, as an activist, I promise the disabled population one thing. I will never back down from a fight. I will never back up from a fight. I will not get out of a fight, not until we reach, you know, a great, a great, uh, you know, result. As a person with blindness, I'm a, as a blind person myself, I know what being unemployed means. I know what does it mean to be in a hardship. I know what does it mean to be a barrier. I know what does it mean to, um, to feel like, you know, not that respected. For that matter, I can tell you that I'm not going to stop that until, uh, you know, we even uh, try our best to end uh, the stigma, whether in the state of Michigan, whether in Washington, D.C., whether all over the states and even the world. I think in America, we've come a long way. Our technology is helping us uh, extremely um, great. Um, you know, the uh, unemployment rate is going down as a result of a lot of advocacy efforts from all the organizations, all the individuals, everybody. So I kindly invite everybody, as Hala said, to, um, you know, stand side by side. Let's collaborate. Let us work together. It's not about fame. It's not about the spotlight. It's about giving the underprivileged the opportunity. If I'm blessed to be strong and passionate and having the ability to remain patient and overcome my barriers doesn't mean that everybody has the same chance. And one more thing also, we have to distinguish between culture and religion. Uh, we have uh, to um, pave the way for employment. Again, employment is the only way uh, by which we pull a lot of our disabled population of disabled people from sheltered employment. And sheltered employment is basically when somebody gets to a job now and they, they stay in the same position, the same pay, the very minimal benefits for 20 or 30 years. What does that mean? They're not gonna make any good living. They're not gonna uh, go about you know, creating a great life. So I'm Khudr Farhab and I promise to fight for the last breath um, of my life for advocacy, for justice and advocacy and equality for all, whether disabled or not. And I'll be more than happy to cooperate. I would like to thank you so much once again. God bless you, Munir. God bless everybody and uh, keep up the good work. Thank you. I mean, thank you all so much. Thank you to the Mis Michigan Disability Rights Coalition, to Brianna, to Omar, um, to everybody watching on Facebook and everybody who tuned in. Um, thank you so much. Jazakallah care. May Allah bless the, the initiative that came um, that this event came out of and guide us to a world with more disability justice for every single person, uh, inshallah. I mean, have a good, amazing evening. Mm -hmm.